Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Junior English. We are in our My Perspectives volume on page 432, 433 and following. We're working now with Sarah Orrin Jewett's A White Heron. Now we've commented on the idea that often the stories, the texts that we study, are what we call buildings Roman. That idea of the coming of age story. And here we're going to have one of the great coming of age stories. Now I want you to jot this down at 2B right away. We're going to ask about symbolism in this story, so that's significant. We're going to ask about what the white heron symbolizes. At 3A, we'll come back to an earlier text that we studied when we were freshmen, the Scarlet Ibis, and we're going to see some similarities in the, in, in, uh, the regards to the two texts. It's one of the most beautifully written st uh, stories, so I want you to as well comment for yourself at 2B really quickly, not what Joe says, but how Joe says it, that is to say rhetoric, um, the, the idea of word choice and the way in which descriptions will happen here and the beautiful descriptions of nature. Of course, ultimately, there will be a decision that's made in this story. On what grounds is the decision made and do you agree or disagree with the decision? Now, we're going to work with a professional reader here as we work through. I'm not going to stop the story, but I am going to point out to you already, notice how the story is divided into parts. So you'll have part one starting on page uh, 433, part two starting on page uh, 438 to finish on page 442, 41 different paragraphs of this story. And so I want you to conquer monkey mind and really concentrate as, it, as the story unfolds. What is the coming of age that will happen here uh, for the young lady of the story, Sylvia? A White Heron by Sarah Orne Jewett. Short story. Background. For the White Heron in this story is another name for the snowy egret, a bird that nests near water and in swamps. At the time this story was written, the snowy egret was hunted for its feathers, and the species almost became extinct. Mark that. However, the efforts of conservationists have since helped the snowy egret population to recover, and the bird is no longer considered endangered. About the author. Page 432. A white heron is the most popular story Sarah Orne Jewett, born 1849, died 1909, wrote. As a young girl, she often accompanied her father, a physician, as he made house calls through rural Maine. Later, she would fold her keen recollections of the region's people and wildlife into her stories, novels, and poems. She sold her first story to the Atlantic Monthly when she was 19, Martin. and she soon became well-known for her precise descriptions and sharp observations of the women and men who lived near the Atlantic Ocean in southern Maine. Back to 433. A White Heron by Sarah Orne Jewett. 1. The woods were already filled with shadows one June evening, just before 8 o'clock, though a bright sunset still glimmered faintly among the trunks of the trees. A little girl was driving home her cow, a plodding, dilatory, provoking creature in her behavior, but a valued companion for all that. They were going away from whatever light there was and striking deep into the woods, but their feet were familiar with the path, and it was no matter whether their eyes could see it or not. There was hardly a night the summer through when the old cow could be found waiting at the pasture bars. On the contrary, it was her greatest pleasure to hide herself away among the huckleberry bushes. And though she wore a loud bell, she had made the discovery that if one stood perfectly still, it would not ring. So Sylvia had to hunt for her until she found her and call, Co! Co! with never an answering moo until her childish patience was quite spent. If the creature had not given good milk and plenty of it, the case would have seemed very different to her owners. Besides, Sylvia had all the time there was and very little use to make of it. 434. Sometimes in pleasant weather, it was a consolation to look upon the cow's pranks as an intelligent attempt to play hide and seek. And as the child had no playmates, she lent herself to this amusement with a good deal of zest. 
Though this chase had been so long that the wary animal herself had given an unusual signal of her whereabouts, Sylvia had only laughed when she came upon Mistress Mooley at the swamp side and urged her affectionately homeward with a twig of birch leaves. The old cow was not inclined to wander farther. She even turned in the right direction for once as they left the pasture and stepped along the road at a good pace. She was quite ready to be milked now and seldom stopped to browse. Sylvia wondered what her grandmother would say because they were so late. It was a great while since she had left home at half past five o'clock, but everyone knew the difficulty of making this errand a short one. Mrs. Tilly had chased the horned torment too many summer evenings herself to blame anyone else for lingering and was only thankful as she waited that she had Sylvia nowadays to give such valuable assistance. The good woman suspected that Sylvia loitered occasionally on her own account. There never was such a child for straying about out of doors since the world was made. Everybody Mark said that. that it was a good change for a little maid who had tried to grow for eight years in a crowded manufacturing town. But as for Sylvia herself, it seemed as if she never had been alive at all before she came to live at the farm. Mark that. She thought often with wistful compassion of a wretched geranium that belonged to a town neighbor. Afraid of folks, old Mrs. Tilly said to herself with a smile after she had made the unlikely choice of Sylvia from her daughter's house full of children and was returning to the farm. Afraid of folks, they said. I guess she won't be troubled no great with them up to the old place. When they reached the door of the lonely house and stopped to unlock it, and the cat came to purr loudly and rub against them, a deserted pussy indeed, but fat with young robins, Sylvia whispered that this was a beautiful place to live in, and she never should wish to go home. The companions followed the shady wood road, the cow taking slow steps, and the child very fast ones. The cow stopped long at the brook to drink, as if the pasture were not half a swamp, and Sylvia stood still and waited, letting her bare feet cool themselves in the shoal water while the great twilight moths struck softly against her. Mark that. She waded on through the brook as the cow moved away and listened to the thrushes with a heart that beat fast with pleasure. There was a stirring in the great boughs overhead. They were full of little birds and beasts that seemed to be wide awake and going about their world, or else saying good night to each other in sleepy twitters. Sylvia herself felt sleepy as she walked along. However, it was not much farther to the house and the air was soft and sweet. She was not often in the woods so late as this, and it made her feel as if she were a part of the gray shadows and the moving leaves. 435. She was just thinking how long it seemed since she first came to the farm a year ago, and wondering if everything went on in the noisy town just the same as when she was there. The thought of the great red-faced boy who used to chase and frighten her made her hurry along the path to escape from the shadow of the trees. Mark shadow. Suddenly, this little woods girl is horror-stricken to hear a clear whistle not very far away. Not a bird's whistle, which would have a sort of friendliness, but a boy's whistle, determined and somewhat aggressive. Sylvia left the cow to whatever sad fate might await her and stepped discreetly aside into the bushes, but she was just too late. The enemy had discovered her and called out in a very cheerful and persuasive tone. Hello, ah, little girl. How far is it to the road? And trembling Sylvia answered almost inaudibly, a good ways. She did not dare to look boldly at the tall young man who carried a gun over his shoulder, but she came out of her bush and again followed the cow while he walked alongside. I have been hunting for some birds, the stranger said kindly, and I have lost my way and need a friend very much. Don't be afraid, he added gallantly. Speak up and tell me what your name is and whether you think I can spend the night at your house. 
and go out gunning early in the morning. Sylvia was more alarmed than before. Would not her grandmother consider her much to blame? But who could have foreseen such an accident as this? It did not seem to be her fault, and she hung her head as if the stem of it were broken, but managed to answer Sylvie with much effort when her companion again asked her name. Mrs. Tilly was standing in the doorway when the trio came into view. The cow gave a loud moo by way of explanation. Yes, you'd better speak up for yourself, you old trial. Where'd she tucked herself away this time, Sylvie? But Sylvie kept an odd silence. She knew by instinct that her grandmother did not comprehend the gravity of the situation. She must be mistaking the stranger for one of the farmer lads of the region. The young man stood his gun beside the door and dropped a lumpy game bag beside it. Then he bade Mrs. Tilly good evening and repeated his wayfarer story and asked if he could have a night's lodging. Put me anywhere you like, he said. I must be off early in the morning before day, but I am very hungry indeed. Young can give me some milk at any rate, that's plain. Dear sakes, yes, responded the hostess, whose long slumbering hospitality seemed to be easily awakened. You might fare better if you went out to the main road a mile or so, but you're welcome to what we've got. I'll milk right off, and you make yourself at home. You can sleep on husks or feathers, she proffered graciously. I raised them all myself. There's a good pasturing for geese just below here towards the marsh. Now step round and set a plate for the gentleman, Sylvie. And Sylvia promptly stepped. She was glad to have something to do, and she was hungry herself. It was a surprise to find as clean and comfortable a little dwelling in this New England wilderness. The young man had known the horrors of its most primitive housekeeping and the dreary squalor of that level of society which does not rebel at the companionship of hens. This was the best thrift of an old-fashioned farmstead, though on such a small scale that it seemed like a hermitage. Mark that. He listened eagerly to the old woman's quaint talk. He watched Sylvia's pale face and shining gray eyes with ever-growing enthusiasm and insisted that this was the best supper he had eaten for a month. And afterward, the new-made friends sat down in the doorway together while the moon came up. Soon, it would be berry time, and Sylvia was a great help at picking. The cow was a good milker, though a plaguey thing to keep track of. The hostess gossiped frankly, adding presently that she had buried four children, so Sylvia's mother and a son who might be dead in California, were all the children she had left. Dan, my boy, was a great hand to go gunning, she explained sadly. I never wanted for partridges or gray squirrels while he was to home. He's been a great wanderer, I expect, and he's no hand to write letters. There, I don't blame him. I'd had seen the world myself if it had been so I could. Sylvie takes after him. The grandmother continued affectionately after a minute's pause. There ain't a foot of ground she don't know her way over, and the wild creature's counter is one of themselves. Squirrels she'll tame to come and feed right out of her hands, and all sorts of birds. Last winter, she got the jaybirds to bang in here, and I believe she is skating herself of her own meals to have plenty to throw out amongst them if I hadn't kept watch. Anything but crows, I tell her, but I'm willing to help support. Though Dan, he had attained one of them that did seem to have reason, same as folks. It was round here a good spell after he went away. Dan and his father, they didn't hitch. But he never held up his head again after Dan had dared him and gone off. The guests did not notice this hint of family sorrows in his eager interest in something else. So Sylvie knows all about birds, does she? He exclaimed as he looked round at the little girl who sat very demure but increasingly sleepy in the moonlight. I am making a collection of birds myself. I have been at it ever since I was a boy. Mrs. Tilly smiled. There are two or three very rare ones I have been hunting for these five years. I mean to get them on my own ground if they can be found. 437. Do you cage him up? Asked Mrs. Tilly doubtfully in response to this enthusiastic announcement. 
Oh no, they're stuffed and preserved, dozens and dozens of them, said the ornithologist, and I have shot or snared everyone myself. I caught a glimpse of a white heron a few miles from here on Saturday, Mark it. and I have followed it in this direction. They have never been found in this district at all. The little white heron it is. And he turned again to look at Sylvia with the hope of discovering that the rare bird was one of her acquaintances. But Sylvia was watching a hop toad in the narrow footpath. Mark that. You wouldn't know the heron if you saw it, the stranger continued eagerly. A queer, tall, white bird with soft feathers and long, thin legs. And it would have a nest, perhaps, in the top of a high tree made of sticks, something like a hawk's nest. Sylvia's heart gave a wild beat. She knew that strange white bird. Mark. It had once stolen softly near where it stood in some bright green swamp grass, away over at the other side of the woods. There was an open place where the sunshine always seemed strangely yellow and hot, where tall, nodding rushes grew, and her grandmother had warned her that she might sink in the soft black mud underneath and never be heard of more. Not far beyond were the salt marshes, just the side of the sea itself, which Sylvia wondered and dreamed much about, but never had seen, whose great voice could sometimes be heard above the noise of the woods on stormy nights. I can't think of anything I should like so much as to find that heron's nest, the handsome stranger was saying. I would give $10 to anybody who could show it to me, Mark. he added desperately. And I mean to spend my whole vacation hunting for it, if need be. Perhaps it was only migrating, or had been chased out of its own region by some bird of prey. Mrs. Tilly gave amazed attention to all this, but Sylvia still watched the toad, not divining, as she might have done at some calmer time, Mark it. that the creature wished to get to its hole under the doorstep and was much hindered by the unusual spectators at that hour of the evening. No amount of thought that night could decide how many wished for treasures the $10 so lightly spoken of would buy. The next day, the young sportsman hovered about the woods and Sylvia kept him company. Having lost her first fear of the friendly lad who proved to be most kind and sympathetic. He told her many things about the birds and what they knew and where they lived and what they did with themselves. And he gave her a jackknife, which she thought as great a treasure as if she were a desert islander. All day long, he did not once make her troubled or afraid, except when he brought down some unsuspecting singing creature from its bow. Sylvia, would have liked him vastly better without his gun. Mark that. She could not understand why he killed the very birds he seemed to like so much. 438. But as the day waned, Sylvia still watched the young man with loving admiration. She had never seen anybody so charming and delightful. The woman's heart, asleep in the child, was vaguely thrilled by a dream of love. Some premonition of that great power stirred and swayed these young creatures who traversed the solemn woodlands with soft-footed silent care. They stopped to listen to a bird's song. They pressed forward again eagerly, parting the branches, speaking to each other rarely and in whispers, the young man going first and Sylvia following, fascinated, a few steps behind, with her gray eyes dark with excitement. She grieved because the long for white heron was elusive, but she did not lead the guest, she only followed, and there was no such thing as speaking first. Mark that. The sound of her own unquestioned voice would have terrified her. It was hard enough to answer yes or no when there was need of that. At last, evening began to fall, and they drove the cow home together. And Sylvia smiled with pleasure when they came to the place where she heard the whistle and was afraid only the night before. Two. All right, let's pause for a moment now. Jot down a couple of things. First of all, character development. Notice that Sylvia two times is referenced as gray-eyed. Now, of course, this will make us smile and go to 3A right away because that will make us think of the gray-eyed or flashing Athena 
And certainly we're going to be playing with that motif. Now, in this story, notice that the young nine-year-old girl is a girl of nature. She enjoys being out in nature. And she feels comfortable out there, but at the same time, she has obviously these kind of fears, these potential anxieties. When she meets the young man, she is right away a little bit concerned. Of course, the young man is symbolic of the outsider, the one who brings the firearm with him, the one who is looking to try to extract some, you know, special birds from uh, the woods. And he will offer $10, which is a substantial amount of money within the context of our story, to, of course, Sylvia and to her grandmother. What could happen if only they could get this money? So jot it down before we move on to part two. What's the central conflict in your mind right now? What is it that she has to decide? Well, she has seen the bird, but notice she will not comment on the fact that she has seen this heron. Now, the question will be, at what moment in the story will she decide to make her proclamation of knowing this bird, or will she not? Of course, she's probably going to go in search of the bird as well. Let's point out uh, already that this white heron that we'll get more to now has to be a symbol of something. So I want you to write that down. What possibly could this be a symbol of? Let's now jump to part two. I'm on page 438, and let's finish the story and see what Sylvia decides to do. The land was highest. A great pine tree stood, the last of its generation. Whether it was left for a boundary mark, or for what reason no one could say, the woodchoppers who had felled its mates were dead and gone long ago, and a whole forest of sturdy trees, pines and oaks and maples, had grown again. But the stately head of this old pine towered above them all, and made a landmark for sea and shore miles and miles away. Sylvia knew it well. She had always believed that whoever climbed to the